As a second speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Robin Tobias Jaus. Robin studied biology in Leipzig and received his PhD in biology in 2021. And ever since, he's been working as a scientist at the uh, Institute of Human Genetics at the University of Leipzig Medical Center. And there he's involved in routine diagnostics with a focus on exome analysis and the development of novel tools aiding diagnostic departments and processes. And today he will talk about how standardized filtering strategies and API-enabled workflows accelerate exome diagnostics. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I'm very happy to share the experience we made in Leipzig um, with our filtering strategies and API workflows um, in our routine diagnostics. Um, yeah, first of all, my conflict of interest statement is there that I received travel compensation from Limbus. And um, as an introduction, I guess we can keep it quite short. We all know that exon sequencing is, in fact, significantly increasing the diagnostic yield over time. But the problem is that, um, as opposed to older approaches, we also have an increasing number of variants which we have to interpret and which we have to analyze. So in Leipzig, when we started with uh, very small targeted panels, like um, epilepsy-specific panels, for example, we had to analyze around about 350 variants uh, per case. And more comprehensive panels um, are then increasing the number of variants and switching then to exomes um, significantly increased this number again. So with um, our BGI exome analyses, we had to evaluate around about 100,000 variants uh, per case, which is quite a lot. Interestingly, when we switched to more comprehensive um, exome kits and as sequencing technologies improve, this number then drops again, but still 60,000 variants uh, per case is quite a lot. And things are getting even worse when we talk about genomes, but um, this should not be part of the talk today. So with this many variants, the question arises, how do we find this metaphorical needle in the haystack? How do we find the variant which is causative for the phenotype of our patient? And the approach might sound a bit stupid, but it makes absolute sense. We have to reduce this number of, uh, this vast amount of variants, um, number of variants which you have to interpret. And we can do this in two ways. We can either use um, targeted in silico panel approaches, or we can use efficient variant filtering to reduce this number. So starting with the in silico panels, um, these are not um, physical panels, but um, what we do with our whole exome data is that we subset um, all the genes from the exome to a more specific set of genes of interest. Um, the benefit is, of course, that we reduce um, the time and amount of variants to interpret because we are reducing the number of genes we are analyzing. And we can also focus on uh, genes with have, which have a very definite disease association and do not have to spend time evaluating if this gene is uh, even of particular relevance for our patient. But the drawback is, of course, that um, a gene might not be present in an in silico panel. And if this is the case, it will be missed uh, during the diagnostic yield. Um, this is also why all these in silico panels always need to be kept up to date regularly. And we have to deal with a um, very fast growing number of uh, resources which are providing targeted um, in silico panels. The question is now how do we obtain these in silico panels in the first place? So how do we decide which genes we want to include um, in this in silico panel for our specific patients? Um, we can do this either manually, so if you are lucky enough and um, you have a um, sender writing on the lab um, request report um, that he's familiar with uh, human genetics and maybe he suspects um, a specific disorder, has some genes in mind that can only be causative for the patient. Um, but as you working in diagnostic departments may know, this is not always the case. So most of the time the sender is not familiar with human genetics and is not providing uh, a list of genes which we have to analyze. So we need to get these in silico panels um, from somewhere else, for example, from public resources. And as I said, we have a growing number of resources um, providing in silico panels. Um, the two examples which we are using in Leipzig the most um, are the, the Genomics England panel app, um, providing detailed panels for specific disorders, um, or we also sometimes use um, the SysNDD um, database, which provides a panel um, a curated panel exclusively focusing on genes with a definite association with neurodevelopmental disorders. 
So um, these in silico panels, for example, from PanelLab, are usually um, curated or expert curated lists of um, genes which have a definite disease association. And we can also implement these in silico panels very easily into Varvis via the API. Um, what we can, for example, do is um, we use the API provided by the Genomics England panel app on a regular basis, download um, all the panels available, and then upload them to Varvis also via the API. And this then yields um, a set of in silico panels, which, we can, which you can use. Um, and you can also do this regularly, like once a month or twi um, once uh, uh, every two years or so. And then you can also track the number of um, genes which are included in the panels. Um, you can track them with the uh, version number of the panel for repro reproducibility. Um, and you can also inactivate uh, older and outdated in silico panels in Varvis. Um, these in silico panels are very useful when we are dealing with um, very specific phenotypes where only a small subset of genes can only be causative uh, for this um, disorder. But most of the time, which is especially true for neurodevelopmental disorders and or epilepsy, for example, um, this is, these, these panels might not be comprehensive enough. Um, and this is also why the major limitation of in silico panel approaches is that a gene can in fact be relevant, but it may be absent from the panel. So what can we do to overcome this um, very big problem with the panels is um, we can use a more comprehensive um, set, not only focusing on specific disorders, but taking into consideration every gene that has a definite disease association, not only for specific phenotypes. Um, this is what we did in Leipzig. We developed the Morbid Genes Panel, which is a very comprehensive list, um, combining different resources which are public and or curated um, to generate um, a very large list of all these relevant genes, taking into consideration if a gene has an omen phenotype, if we have a specific number of pathogenic variants in ClinVa, for example, if this um, gene is present in Panel App or in SysNVD, for example. Um, if you're interested, we also provide this Morbid Genes panel um, freely available on the public website, morbidgenes.org. Um, and you can also track the um, panel number, which we, we update on a regular basis. So every month we release um, a new panel version. Also, this Morbid Genes panel can easily be implemented into Varvis by using the API. You can download the set of genes with a simple uh, script and upload it to Varvis. You do not have to type all these 6,000 genes manually into Varvis. So with these comprehensive in silico panels, um, we could um, reduce the number of variants to interpret from 60,000 to round about 20,000. And the thing that we did is that we reduced the number of irrelevant genes without a disease association to zero. But as you can see, the number of variants which we have to interpret did not increase to one, the one variant we want to identify. So coming back to this um, decision tree, um, what we observe is that in, <coughs> in silico panels and variant filtering um, have, to be, have to come hand in hand. So, what we do is um, we have this metaphorical haystack where we want to find the needle, but without in silico panels, we realize that we are not looking at a haystack, but in this haystack, we also have bricks and dirt and all kinds of other nasty stuff you do not want to include in your diagnostic routine. And in silico panels are then useful to reduce this pile to the haystack, and efficient variant filtering then retrieves the needle in the haystack. Um, the general aspects of variant filtering are that um, we filter for the relevant variants in our subset of diagnostically relevant genes, which we used with our in silico panel. And there are different approaches um, how we can filter for variants. So, for example, um, a very useful filter might be that we are looking for variants that have been classified as pathogenic before, which are known to be pathogenic. Maybe we want to subset the variants to a set of um, variants with a specific functional consequence, for so example, exclusively looking at um, loss of function variants or other null variants. Um, the prevalence in the general population can also be taken into account. Um, 
The phenotypic overlap is, um, is also filterable uh, in Varvis. And last but not least, you maybe want to filter for the mode of inheritance. Um, we, in, in our experience, we observed that um, very few versatile filters can already be sufficient um, to detect relevant variants. So the more filters we apply in our filtering chain, the less likely it is um, that we identify a relevant variant. Um, I will come to that back in a few moments. Um, our filtering chain in Leipzig consists of um, specific steps. So first of all, we have a look at um, known pathogenic variants based on resources like uh, ClinVor or our in-house database or um, other external annotations from Varvis. Um, and if this is unremarkable, we then have a look at the functional consequence, particularly looking at um, frame shift, stop gain, splice variants, or missions variants that have um, very high in silico prediction scores. And again, if this is unremarkable, we take into consideration the prevalence in the general population, looking at variants that are absent or very rare in GNOMAT, um, also absent from our in-house database. And then, important, um, it, it is also important to filter for the phenotypic overlap, so a variant might be described as pathogenic and might be rare in the general population, but if you do not have a phenotypic overlap, this variant might obviously be not relevant for your patient. And the last filtering step we apply is that we take into consideration the mode of inheritance, especially looking at de novo variants, homozygous variants, or maybe also variants in gene that have an imprinting mechanism. The variant filtering in Varvis is um, quite customizable because it is based on regular expressions. Um, so our favorite filter is the so-called A45 filter, which is based on historical reasons, um, variants with a class four or a class five. Um, and this filter is built um, to take into consideration variants that have been described as pathogenic in ClinVar, with this uh, regular expression here highlighted in blue. Then we have a look at our in-house database and the Olexis database, combining the resource from all Varvis users. And with this versatile filtering chain approach, we can easily solve um, our cases. So I would like to present some uh, very straightforward cases from our Leipzig Institute here. Um, what we, for example, had was a 39-year-old man with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and this very first step in our filtering chain already reveals that we have a splice variant in MYB BP3, described as 16 times pathogenic in ClinVar, canonical splice site, loss of function, so very straightforward, a recurrent variant um, causative for the phenotype. Um, and the second filtering step um, which we could solve was um, we had a case with a 20-year-old woman with neurodevelopmental delay and some dysmorphic features. And in this case, our first step did not reveal a variant that has been described as pathogenic before, which is most of the time the case. Um, but then our LGD filter, which stands for likely gene disrupting, um, revealed a null variant in the ZBP1 gene, um, clear phenotypic overlap, not present in GNOMAT, so also a, a case we could solve with just two filtering steps. And when looking at variants absent from GNOMAT, um, we had a case with a 16-year-old woman with a suspected Modi diabetes, um, no pathogenic variants identified before, um, no null variants, no, uh, no frame shift or stop gain variants, but in HNF1A, we identified um, a variant with a very specific phenotypic overlap, uh, which is causing the Modi diabetes. Um, the variant is in the functional domain. Pathogenic missions variants have been described at the same position. So again, a case which could be solved in just three filtering steps. These filters I presented can also be combined with other filters um, to further exclude um, variants that might be irrelevant for your case. So often it might be useful to exclude variants that, for example, are recurrently being described as benign. You do not want to have a look at these variants. Um, maybe you also want to exclude variants that are synonymous or have a very low impact because they are intronic, for example. Um, low quality and coverage uh, should also be filtered out. 
and maybe you want to exclude variants um, associated with genes causing a recessive phenotype, of course, after you have checked homozygous and compound heterozygous variants. And also variants very highly prevalent in the general population might not be useful uh, in cases with very severe phenotypes. But again, we have um, a very caveat, uh, big problem here because um, combining more and more filtering chains, um, so excessive variant filtering harbors the uh, extreme risk of false negative results because you might accidentally um, exclude a variant by applying too many filters. I have brought some examples from our institute here um, where we almost missed uh, a variant if you would have filtered too harsh in every case. Um, for example, we had a case with um, the HFF, HFE-associated hemochromatosis. And here in this <coughs> disorder, we have um, a very recurrent pathogenic <coughs> variant with a very high prevalence in GNOMAT. So the prevalence is more than 3%. It has been described as homozygous um, nearly 300 times. Um, and it is important to note that filter, filtering variants um, Filtering exclusively for the variant prevalence in uh, disorders which have a very low penetrance like hemochromatosis or disorders which may represent at a subclinical level, um, this may lead to false negative results when only taking the prevalence into account. Another example is the PRRT2 associated um, benign neonatal seizure disorder. Uh, here we have a similar case. We have a recurrent pathogenic variant which is described um, which is found more than 500 times in GNOMAT. But here, um, the problem is that this variant lies in a very GC-rich region in a um, HOMO C polymer, and these allele counts in GNOMAT are, in fact, false positive. So this is also what GNOMAT provides here. The variant filter, um, fails the random forest filters, so they are false positive in GNOMAT. And again, filtering for the variant prevalence might have excluded this variant. And another example is um, the EIF3F associated neurodevelopmental disorder. So this gene is known to be associated with the recessive form of neurodevelopmental, dis uh, neurodevelopmental delay. But the problem is that um, NDD is not an associated HPO term with this gene. As we can see here, the only HPO term associated with EIF3F are seizures. And if your patient does not have seizures, but only intellectual disability, the HPO similarity overlap score is very, very low. And here, filtering, um, here, this gene harbors the risk um, to be filtered out when only filtering for a very high phenotypic overlap. Um, so coming back to my uh, very short introduction with the exome sequencing, I said we definitely increase the diagnostic yield. Um, but still, most of the exome sequencing, uh, here we only take into consider consideration SNV and CNV calling. And with this, we have two another blind spots remaining for the exome diagnostics, which are uniparental disomies and repeat expansion disorders, which we are usually not able to detect in a standard exome uh, sequencing approach. But here, um, the good thing is that uh, we can tackle these problems um, by creating supplementary tools which are incorporating the API from Vavis. And I would like to present you two examples here. Um, for example, considering the uniparental disomies, what we, what we did in Leipzig is we developed a tool called the ALT-IF plotter, so alternate allele frequency plotter which is a web interface which can plot um, the alternate allele fractions per chromosome for the cases. And we are utilizing the Vavis API to directly implement the um, uh, obtaining the VCF files um, per person and for the parents. And then we plot the alternate allele um, fractions and detect runs of homozygosity or unexpected inheritance patterns. So for example, what, with our tool, what we do here is um, we plot the where the mouse here, um, the runs of homozygosity per chromosome, which might be unremarkable, but then when looking at the inheritance ratios, dividing the metanol variants over the paternal variants, this may um, show very extraordinary patterns where you should suspect um, a uniparital disomy. 
So looking at this example here, which is chromosome 22, plotting the uh, maternal variance here in red, we see a quite normal distribution. We have on the y-axis the alternate allele fraction, and on the x-axis um, the chromosome position. And this is what we expect usually. We have heterozygous variants, so an alternate allele frequency from uh, round about 0 0.5. But this is only true for the maternal variants. When having a look at the paternal variants, you do not see any, or very rarely these might be artifacts. So in this case, we interestingly do not have any paternal variants and only vari variants inherited from the mother. So here we should suspect um, a heterodisomy on chromosome 22. Mm, this um, alter F plotter is also freely available um, if you scan this QR code. So of course, this then does not implement the Vardis API, but you can um, upload your VCF files um, by hand. And we also have a poster here at the ESHG. Um, if you're interested, uh, have a look there. Um, the second blind spot in exome diagnostics are repeat expansion disorders, um, which usually are not able to be detected with short read sequencing. But here again, um, you can develop a, a web interface um, utilizing um, published programs like uh, Expansion Hunter. This is also what we did. We also built a website um, using the Vavis API to retrieve the BAM files and then automatically run Expansion Hunter per case. Um, yeah, we called this uh, program Repeater with a tiny goat because in German uh, a goat might be a Ziegenpeter. So this is our IT, our IT department is quite uh, funny. <laughs> um, so with this um, API-based approach, we uh, collect the BAMs and then. Uh, hunt the expansions and then retrieve the results. For example, in this case, we have a pathogenic repeat expansion from the TBP gene, uh, gene and could solve this case not in Vavis, but in a web interface which is utilizing the API. So to sum this up, um, coming back to this finding the needle in the haystack, um, we observed that in silico panels are in fact very useful to subset the whole exome to a very tiny set of diagnostically relevant genes. But we have to be aware that we may be excluding genes, uh, that we may have false negative results if we are excluding genes from our in silico panels. Also, reproducible and versatile variant filtering uh, significantly reduces the time needed to identify the causative variant in our patient, but excessive variant filtering can lead to false negative results. And we can incorporate the API um, into supplementary tools, which you can develop yourself or just ask your bioinformatics department. This is actually quite easy um, to uh, further fill the remaining blind spots which we have in our exome sequencing. For example, we use this API to uh, manage our in silico panels, detect UPDs, or other repeat expansion disorders. And with that, I'm at the end. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. So I think we have time for maybe one or two questions before we continue. If there is any. Can you, can you wait a second for the microphone so that the online participants have a chance to understand Thanks. the question? Thank Hello. you. Very, very nice presentation. Very thank nice. You. Do you have any cutoff for the HPO similarity? Um, well, this is th that's the thing. We do not have a cutoff because we um, are not exclusively looking at the HPO similarity. So um, in our experience, an HPO overlap of um, 0 0.1 is very good. Um, everything that's below this is not so good. And for example, an HPO score from 0 0.2 or maybe even 0 0.3 is a nearly perfect P um, HPO overlap. But um, as I said, it's important to note that we are not exclusively filtering um, for the HPO overlap. This is just um, another line of evidence we take into account. And second question is regarding repeat expansion. Um, in exomes, it's a PCR-based approach. Can you share your experience of results? How much false positive you are getting? So we, um, we are not routinely running the Expansion Hunter um, interface for every case, only for um, cases where the symptoms are already to be su suspected to be caused by a repeat expansion disorder, so most neurological cases, for example. 
Our experience is that most of them are um, unremarkable. Um, so maybe from 100 cases, we solved two with this um, expansion hunter-based approach. And we also um, validate them in the lab. Um, so we are not um, solely relying on uh, expansion hunter, but always have a second validated uh, step. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, one more question. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I have one, two, two questions. First one's hopefully really quick. Um, when, you, when you select a gene panel, um, or upload a gene panel, are you able to select which transcripts you use? Um, not, with the, not within the in silico panel, but in Vavis you can select um, the default transcript right. you want to have a look at. Okay. Um, and Vavis also provides all transcripts for the gene which are annotated. Yeah, yeah. thanks. And then, um, so you describe your filtering strategy. Do you have a feel for how long it takes to analyze a case? I know it's quite a hard question, like, uh, but for a WES. Well, th yeah, that, that definitely depends on, uh, on, the, on the case. So if we have a case with a suspected hyper, hypercholesterolemia, some hypercholesterol, Jesus, hypercholesterolemia, this disorder, yeah. <laughs> um, this may be very fast because there is all, uh, only a handful of genes uh, which have to be analyzed, but very complex cases like neurodevelopmental disorders, they take some time. Um, I, so I cannot exactly tell you how long we, ta uh, we need for every case, but um, every scientific staff member at our institute um, round about does three cases per day, so three exome cases per day. Thank you. Um, You've shown this uh, filtering strategy with these like four or five um, parts. So do you have this standardized so everyone in your lab would do the same procedure, the same filtering strategy? And I mean, we have discussing this issue also back and forth. Um, if there's also value of different people looking slightly differently at the data, so not everyone does the same. So you everyone will make the same mistake or miss the same things, right? Yeah, so there are specific filters which all of our um, staff members are using, which is also important because we are an accredited, I don't know if this is the correct English term, accredited, accredited lab. Um, and this is uh, crucial for the accreditation for our SOP that we are using reproducible filtering steps. Um, but after these, um, let's say, mandatory filters, um, after all they are unremarkable, then every, um, every member of our team can do their own filtering to maybe find um, additional variants or so. But in our experience, the filters I um, presented, um, if they are all unremarkable, then we are not finding anything else in the exome.